come again gave me a new song to sing i don't deserve his love and grace but on the cross he took my place that's why he's wonderful to me jesus is wonderful yes he is wonderful jesus is wonderful so blue thank you lord for the sparrows that sing they make sweet melody the rivers that flow the rain and the snow Amen. Good evening. Good to see you tonight in midweek Bible study. Glad to see everybody here. Hopefully you're having a good week thus far. And uh, we'll pray in a few minutes that your week could keep on uh, doing good and God taking care of you. Amen. And I uh, appreciate the showers of blessing the Lord's given us today. Thank God for the, uh, have y'all told, can y'all tell a difference in the air in the last few days? Uh, man, I'm glad that uh, fall is upon us, is upon us. Uh, let's make a few announcements and then we will... Uh, we will sing a song, a, a hymnal, and uh, while we're doing the song, if you have a Wednesday evening offering, and you can come forward and uh, put it in the buckets during that song. Remember, September the 20th is Baptism Sunday during our morning worship hour. If you've never been baptized, there is a sign-up sheet uh, out in the foyer. Please uh, sign up so we'll know how many uh, we got going that day. Also, on the same Sunday after our morning service is Foundation Class, Foundation Class. If you're interested in knowing more about a church and and uh, and uh, making a uh, or interested in being a formal member, if that's the right language to use, uh, we do it on the 20th, and uh, we will uh, have lunch after church together, and then we'll have the foundation class. 
Uh, if you're interested in that, there's also a sign-up sheet for that so we can make preparations for the food. And then don't forget Revival. we got Revival coming up starting September the 27th, 10 o'clock that morning, September the 27th. There'll be no Sunday school. So please be here in your place at 10 o'clock. And uh, the Wisdom is going to kick us off with our homecoming revival. They'll sing for the Sunday school hour. We'll break just for a couple of minutes uh, if the Lord allows us. just depends on how it goes. Amen. I like to see God get in it, and we don't have time for a break. Amen. And uh, we'll come back. And uh, if we do have a break, we'll come back, start at 11 o'clock. They'll sing a few more. And then Dr. Brent Carr will bring the morning message. And then 5 o'clock, uh, Dr. Brent and his family will be back with us. And then every night, Monday through Friday, every night, Monday through Friday, we have some special, uh, other special singing going on throughout the week. So we're looking forward to a good week. We're looking forward to a good week. And then also this coming Sunday night, this coming Sunday night, we will begin a, uh, a study through the book of Revelation, uh, the book of Revelation. And I don't know if you've ever studied through the book of Revelation. There's a lot of stuff in it uh, that's pertaining to the hour in which we're living and a lot of good stuff in it. So we're going to begin every Sunday night starting this coming Sunday. And uh, we're going to go through the book of Revelation together and uh, we'll preach, teach it. And uh, there's a lot of good stuff in there. It ain't, all, it ain't all bad stuff. There's a lot of good stuff in there. Amen. There's a lot of shouting grounds through the book of Revelation. Amen. A lot of encouraging uh, in the book of Revelation. You're in the book of Revelation. Amen. And it uh, just depends on what chapter you fall in. Amen. Oh, shit. Let me, let me say, everybody's in the book of Revelation. Everybody. Everybody. It just depends on where you fall at. But uh, anyway, the Lord's, uh, Lord's directed to do that. And uh, so we're excited about that. And uh, we'll go through it till we get to the end of it. Amen. And wouldn't it be a good thing we get to about uh, chapter number four? Chapter number four where the rapture takes place. And, uh, and we're out of here. Amen. We'll let the rest of them finish it. Amen. So some of you fellas need to be studying. Amen. And uh, you'll catch that here in a little while. Uh, so that's this coming Sunday night. So uh, try to be here as much as you can uh, for the rest of the year. Amen. It's going to take us a while, but we'll enjoy it. And uh, we'll have a good time in the Lord. Amen. As far as I know, that's all the major announcements. Uh, it was a good turnout for Awana tonight. You may not be in here, but they had a parents meeting at 6 o'clock. That was a good number that turned out. So we're excited that Awana is kicking back off tonight. Don't forget Sunday school that's coming Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. And, uh, man, we're just thankful that the Lord is allowing us uh, to get back somewhat normal. Amen. Bible college started last night. And uh, that was a blessing. And I uh, had three new students. And uh, eight total last night, so it uh, don't sound like a lot, but that is a lot. And uh, we appreciate the Lord in uh, allowing us to do that here, being a satellite campus for Carolina Bible College. Amen. Anybody got any uh, major, major uh, important uh, prayer requests we need to pray for tonight before we pray? Anybody? Amen. That's good. Amen. Amen. Nobody knows nobody is dying. Amen. <laughs> we all dying. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Nobody's majorly sick. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, you pray, and I'm going to pray, and then uh, Josh is going to come and lead us in a hymnal, and then uh, we'll receive our offering during that time. Remember, everything that comes in goes to support Awanas. And if you don't know uh, about Awanas, as uh, Miss Kristen announced to the parents, we don't charge a dime. Uh, for our Awanas program here on campus. And uh, if they want to do virtual this year, it's a new thing. If they want to do virtual, uh, we do put a charge on that because of all the other preparation and melons and all the things we have to do. But as far as Awanas on campus, we don't charge a dime. We supply everything for them uh, unless they lose a vest. If they lose a vest now, they have to buy another vest. And, uh, but that's all because of your giving on Wednesday night. And uh, we appreciate that. It allows all them children... And uh, about 80%, I would think, of our children in Awana is uh, outsiders of the church family. And uh, so that's a blessing. Amen. So pray tonight. Ask the Lord's blessings upon our service. Father, we love you. God, we thank you, Lord, for being back with us this evening. God, we thank you, Lord, for the uh, anticipation of getting into the Word of God and the things that you show us and the things that you feed us, the things that sustain us, God. Lord, we appreciate it, God. We appreciate our church, our church family, God. We are thankful tonight. For Awanas and the kickoff to that program, God, we're thankful for all the children that's down there, the parents who took time out to come tonight and bring their children, God, Lord, we don't take that lightly. And I pray, God, the seed that's being sown down in those young hearts, God, will be carried back to the house. And somewhere down the line, God, we will see fruit from the labor. If we don't see it on this side, 
We're looking forward to seeing the fruit on the other side, God. We're just going to continue to do what you've called us to do, and that's to be sowers of the Word of God. So you bless down there tonight, God. You bless in here tonight. I do know, God, Lord, that everybody probably does have a prayer request on their heart. And, God, you know the needs, you know the burdens. God, you know the cares that we face, God. So I pray, God, that you would take control of each and every situation. May your will be done. Lord, save our lost loved ones. Touch those that are afflicted. God, Lord, have your way, Lord, tonight. And we'll thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name I pray. And all God's people say, amen. amen. Let's all stand tonight. We're going to sing in the sweet by and by. And you can bring your offering. Amen. Let's sing together tonight in the sweet by and by. There's a land that is fairer than day. And by faith we can see it afar. For the Father waits over the way to prepare us a dwelling place there. Let's sing now in the sweet by and by. We shall meet on that beautiful shore in the sweet by and by. We shall meet on that beautiful shore on the second. We shall sing on that beautiful shore The melodious songs of the blessed And our spirits shall sorrow no more Not a sign for the blessing of rest In the sweet by and by We shall meet on that beautiful for sure in the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore on the last to our bountiful father above we will offer our tribute of praise for the glorious gift of his love and the blessing Sings that hallow our days. One more time. In the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. In the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. Let's give the Lord some praise tonight. It's good to be here. Be seated. Amen. Did everybody get a sheet of paper tonight I was handing out? Here, Laura, you didn't get one. I gave you one. Didn't I? All right. Take your Bibles then and go to the second book of Timothy, chapter number three. The outline we want to cover tonight, speaking on deception, Satan's major area of activity. And boy, we're ever living in a time of deception. I'm talking about these, I, I, I ain't talking, I don't know if this is right language or not, uh, but I'm talking about good deception. What do you mean? I'm talking about the devil is using good things to deceive people. Uh, using uh, religion and church and good works and good feelings and all this other kind of stuff and uh, using good life, living a good life. You know, if you don't, if you don't cuss, you don't drink. If you're, or if you're only a social drinker and you do this or do that. And y'all know what I'm talking about. I don't want to spend a lot of time uh, talking about those things. Uh, but he's doing a great, great job. Why? Uh, I think that we've been talking this week uh, uh, a lot about the end times and and you know, things like that. And and, and the question was asked to me. Uh, I wonder why the devil. The devil is trying so hard because we believe that the devil knows this Bible, right? I believe the Bible says the devils believe in what? And tremble. So if he knows he's a loser, because you know he's a loser, right? Why is he still trying so hard to deceive and, and wreck the lives of people? It's because he don't believe in the sin, or he believes like he believes he can change it. He's deceived his own self. He still believes that he can overpower God. The devil still believes he can overthrow the throne. 
He still believes he can get at the heart of God, and one day he's going to sit on the throne. Now, listen, now you and I, we don't believe that. Right? Talk back to me tonight, help me tonight. You know, if you just give a holy grunt, uh, we, don't, we, we, we believe the book. And, uh, but that don't change the fact that people's being to say, have you ever wondered why somebody can get saved and, and born again or, or, or supposedly saved or supposedly born again and then all of a sudden something just crazy happens and, they, and their belief system goes out, just out of whack? And I, I ain't talking about the lost world. I'm talking about the saved world. They just start believing things. It's just absolutely crazy because they've been deceived. That is his major area of activity. That's what he's the best at. He's the best at taking something and making something look like what it really ain't, making something sound like something that is really not, twisting the Word of God, getting somebody captivated in their mind to believe something that is not true until he's got them in their snares, his snares and trap, and then after that, they're doomed. You do realize that's why we struggle with the things that we struggle with because of deception. He came in and deceived Eve. I know what the Bible teaches. He came in, twisted the word of God, told her that it really wasn't true, got her believing something, looking at something that, uh, that, you know, that was appealing. Adam falls into the trap. He gets deceived, and then here we are. In 2 Timothy chapter number, chapter number 3, i got to stay to the outline. I hope this will help me so we get done before 7.30, by 7.30. 2 Timothy chapter number 3, verse 12 and 13 says, Yea, and all that will live godly in who? Christ Jesus shall suffer what? Persecution. Now, there's a thousand and one different definitions of persecution. You know, a migraine headache on a Sunday morning ain't persecution. A backache on Sunday morning ain't persecution. That's just called old age, overworking, not lifting something right, or you know you've got brain tumors. Amen. It's not persecution for the cause of Christ. He's talking about right here that those that live godly in Christ Jesus. Now understand something right here. You can live godly outside of Christ Jesus. What do you mean, preacher? You can be doing all the right things that would be looked at as being godly. I mean, loving your wife, you think that's godly? Well, yeah, because the Bible says, husbands, love your wives as Christ has loved the church. I mean, uh, uh, I, mean I ain't going to go on, but you, y'all understand what I'm trying to say. You can be living right, living godly, but not be living right, living godly in Christ Jesus. But if you're living godly in Christ Jesus, you're striving not to please self, not to please Satan, not to please society, but to please the Savior, then you know what, my friend? Then you're going to suffer persecution. Now understand, we ain't suffered like those good old boys and girls down in that book you've read, The, uh, the Trail of Blood. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, the days gone by, how they suffered. Anyway. We ain't faced that yet. Let's just be honest. The biggest persecution that the church, the child of God, is going through right now is picking up your Bible, laying down your remote. (laughs) Paying your tithe instead of going to the steakhouse. Or you fill in the blank, whatever else you're doing. Going to church on Sunday morning and coming back Sunday evening and coming to Bible study Wednesday night. Doing that little, y'all understand what I'm saying? Our biggest persecution lies within this right here on based on how we're feeling. Amen. And the biggest persecution comes right here in our mind. And that's where the devil's playground is at. Look what the Bible said. But evil men and seducers shall wax what? And what? Doing what? And what? <coughs> Being deceived. <coughs> I don't know what just happened right there. <coughs> Man, where's Trevor at? Trevor in here, he outside. <coughs> Can you go get me a cup of water? <coughs> and ice. <coughs> Man, I don't know what just happened right there. Anyway, maybe it's one of his things. Maybe his deception just kicked down to my throat. Listen to something. 
I preach hard, and, and I'm very passionate uh, in, in my preaching. When I'm preaching, especially in the hour in which we're living, and especially on Sunday mornings when I got all the religious crowd here, and I'm preaching on the Democrat, and I'm preaching against all that. All, all the things that's going on but truth of the matter is the reason that crazy world is acting the way they are deceiving the people but remember look what the bible just said right here and being what deceived as they're deceiving they are being deceived understand something i've called her name out a whole lot y'all know who i'm talking about and i said if antichrist could be female she probably would be it y'all know who i'm talking about you know her, her her initials is np i think that's what it is uh you know from california out there you know the lady got caught in the hairdresser last week y'all know who i'm talking about but anyway uh, but truth of the matter is she's lost and, and have you asked this question as I've asked, how in the world can somebody in their right mind be thinking and believe the things that they're thinking and believe? Because they're being deceived. Yeah. Look at it right there at the top. Three things about deception real quickly. Three things about deception. You got these scriptures, Nathan? All right. Matthew 24, verse 4. That'll help me out a whole lot. Look at the warning of the Savior about deception. Matthew 24, 4. And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no man, what? Deceive you. Listen, it is possible for you to be saved and get deceived. Don't think for a minute because you a King James Bible, toting Bible, reading Bible, quoting Baptist church, going hellfire, brimstone, sitting under preaching that, oh, man, I got everything by telling everything's all right. No, my friend, you a high candidate for being deceived. Every one of us is a high candidate for deception. Why? Because you have the one major qualification for deception. It's called living in a body of flesh. And Jesus himself said, take heed, no more, stop, watch, you better be careful, that no, look at that, what? Man, man, man deceive you. That's why I harp and I say all the time not to belittle my position, not to belittle my calling, not to belittle my responsibility. But I say it all the time. You better not just take what I say as 100% for granted. You better go back to the scripture and search it out and with the spirit of God identify and see if it be so. Why? Because I am capable of deception. I can get things twisted up here. How do I know that? Because I've twisted them before. Can I get an amen, Laura? Laura agreed with that. She may not say amen all night, but she'll say amen to that one. I've done it. I have, hey, right, I have been deceived before by, in this book right here. And you know where it started from? Hearing somebody preach something. It sounded good. It fit good. So it must be so. But you know what I found? Then I went to the scriptures later on and started looking for it, and I can't find it nowhere. Or if I did find it, it's way out of context. Y'all understand what I'm saying? The Bible says Jesus warns us that uh, from the Savior that no man to see. Look at number two, the work of the serpent, Matthew 13, 25. Look at what he's doing, Matthew 13, 25. But while men what? Let me bring that into modern time. While men were lazy. While men were laying out. While men were more busy doing something else. While men slept, he is what? Came and sowed tares among the wheat and did what? Went his way. Done his job. He come in there, man, he sowed it, and he knows it's going to get water. He knows it's going to come up. He's done his job. Look at uh, chapter number, same chapter, verse number 36. 36 through 40. Then Jesus sent the multitude away, went into the house, and his disciples came unto him. He is speaking to his disciples. He's not speaking to the lost world. He's not speaking to society. He is speaking to his disciples. Be like speaking to the church tonight. He ain't just speaking to everybody. He's speaking to the blood-bought child of God. Look what he says. Say, declare unto us the parable. The disciples come unto him. Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. Look at verse 37. He answered and said unto them, He that soweth the what? There's good seed, there's bad seed. Is the son of man. Verse 38. The field is what? Let me stop right here and give you some good Bible. 
We just went back over there and we talked about the seed in the field. Look, the Bible says the field is the world. The world. You see how he just answered, what's the field? What's my field? It's the world. You see that right there? The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. The kingdom. The kingdom. So the good seed produces children of the kingdom. You understand what I'm saying? Let me stop right there. This is another man. If the seeds that's being planted in you is not producing, hey, you to be a little closer to God, your spiritual life growing a little bit, it's not good seed. Because the good, the, the, the good seed are the children of the kid, but the tares are the children of the what? The wicked one. That's how a preacher can stand in the pulpit and call out somebody that's sowing bad seed and doing things they ought not be doing and saying things they ought not be sowing amongst the congregation. Why? Because they are the children of the wicked one. And the pastor being the under shepherd is the watchman on the tower that's supposed to call it out. But the Bible says right there, you got the field is the world, the good seed are the children of the kingdom, the tares are the children of the wicked one verse 39 the enemy that sowed them is the devil remember verse 25 he came in he sowed and he left who was it that sowed how you know preacher the enemy that sowed the what the bad seed is the who the devil the harvest is the end of the world and the reapers are the angels look at verse 40 as therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. So you see the work of the devil? The work of the devil is to sow bad seed. The work of the devil ain't about your, 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 your debate between Republican and, De and Democrat. Uh, the work of the devil ain't whether or not you're reading your Bible tonight or you ain't reading your Bible. That's not the work of the devil. That's the work of your flesh. That's two different things. Are you going to tithe or not tithe? That's not the work of the devil. That's just the work of your flesh. If you're going to put God first or not put God first. Y'all follow on? We give a lot of credit to the devil. But truth of the matter, we go back to the Bible. And the Bible tells us what he's doing. If he ain't sowing seed, I didn't look the verse up. You'll find out. He's accuser of the brethren. So when he's out here, he's done so it, and he leaves like he did in that verse uh, 25, whatever verse that was. Yeah, verse 25, and he leaves. Where does he go? He goes back now up to heaven, walks into the throne room of God, and he begins to accuse the brethren before God. You believe he does that? You ever, wrote, you ever read Job chapter number 1? So we got the work of the Satan. We got the warning of the Savior. Look at the wisdom of the sheep. Who are the sheep? You, the children of God. Verses 10 and 4 of the book of John, 4 through, 4 through 5. The Bible says, And when he put it forth his own sheep, he goeth before them. And the sheep, what? Follow who? People have a whole lot of problem following. Everybody wants to lead. But listen to this, write this down. You can't never lead until you learn to follow. See what I'm saying? You got to be willing to follow before you ever can lead. Everybody likes to come in and be, the, and be in the high top authority, whether it's in the church house, whether it's in the cream field. Uh, you know, they want to jump in there, man, and boom, and they're, they're up there, you know. But truth of the matter is, you don't get to where I'm at unless you learn a long time ago how to follow. You got a ladder, you start climbing that ladder, you mean, you can get to search. All I'm saying is this, you be faithful to the little things, and God will add you some things, amen. Y'all follow what I'm saying? But until you get to a point that you know to follow, the Bible says, if the sheep follow him, this is how you can discern one thing, you can find out if you're saved or not, who you're following. Oh, I'm following Jesus, I, I go to church, could you be deceived? Oh, I go, to, I, I, I go to church and, hey, you know, and I pay my tithes. Could you be deceived? Do you pay your tithe because the preacher talks about it? Or do we pay our tithe because we're a cheerful giver? Look at the Bible says, for they, what? Look at that. Look at that. Know his voice. A lot of people don't know the voice of God. Because they ain't sheep. 
but it's impossible to be a sheep and not know his voice. You hear what I'm saying? If you are a sheep, you can know his voice. Now, you can distance yourself so far that his voice is but a faint of a whisper. But what has distanced you is because you quit listening when you was close to him. And you let sin creep in and sin creep in. And as sin's creeping in, it's pushing you further and further and further away from him. Y'all understand what I'm saying so far? But the sheep, listen, you got some wisdom, they, for they know his voice. Listen, you have the capability, the same one I have in every blood-bought child of God. You have the same shepherd I have, the same as the blood-bought child of God has. You have the great shepherd. And when he put forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Verse number 5, and a stranger Will they not follow? Let me ask this question. Why is so many of God's people walking away from God? I tell you why. Because of deception. Are they not a sheep no more? They still a sheep. But they're not hearing them. It ain't, listen, it ain't people say, well, I'm going to go find me another church because I ain't getting fed. It ain't because they ain't getting fed. It's because they ain't eating. They ain't listening as long as that book's being preached. You understand what I'm saying? I know there's some places that is preaching things that is deceiving people. The Bible tells us, I just read it to you, uh, you know, uh, it's going to wax worse and worse, and men is going to seduce and being deceived and, and, and even being deceived. And he says here, they will not follow, but will what? Flee from him. What's the Bible say? Something like this. Draw nigh to God. Says something like this too. Resist the devil and he will flee, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. Look at me before I go any further tonight. You're cutting yourself short. You're selling yourself short. You got more wisdom and understanding than you think you have. You're stronger than you think you are. Why? Because you're a child of the kingdom. You're a sheep. He speaks to his sheep. And when he speaks, the sheep can hear him and know that it's him, which means he can give direction. He can talk. He can smooth. He can, he can do all that you need him to do. He is capable of doing it, and you are capable of understanding it. But listen, deception. How many times, let me ask you this, how many times, have you felt like quitting because you felt like you was no good as a child of God? Do you understand that how you feel and how you perform has nothing to do with you being a child of God? Which means that those moments of thoughts of fiery darts from the devil to deceive you, to convince you that you're no good, God's done with you, you done failed, blah, 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 to get you to the point where your shout's gone, your smile's gone, your peace is gone, your courage is gone, your want to's gone. Next day you know you're just evolving and going through the motions. You may still attend church, but you really ain't in church. Y'all understand what I'm saying? You may show up, but you ain't in it. Y'all follow what I'm saying? Being deceived. Listen, you have the wisdom of God because you are a sheep of the great shepherd. Let's look at deception, Satan's major area of activity. I'm going to give you three things that people are void of. And if they're void of this, they're being majorly deceived. Number one, now you got a blank on your paper. Blank are deceived. Listen, if people are void of chastisement, chastisement, they are deceived. Hebrews chapter 12, I'm going to run through these pretty quick, Nate. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 through 10. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord. Look at that. Nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. People get chastised. People get rebuked today. They get mad, blow up, and leak. Or nobody loves them. Nobody cares about them. Now listen here. I don't fail on God on purpose. I don't do things on purpose to make God. But whenever I do get the chastened hand of God on one side, it hurts. Yes, it does. But on the other side, this is an encouragement. Why? Because if he wouldn't be chastising me if I didn't belong to him. You understand? You So I may get my butt blistered every day. Y'all understand 
well, I don't know how y'all live y'all's life, but he's a chastising me quite often. You say, oh, preacher, it's been a long time. Now, I know we got the old slogan, boy, if you ever go to the Lord's woodshed, you'll never go back. No, my friend, I, that, that God gets on me all the time. Why? Because I live in a body of flesh. He's all the time recommending me. You know, sometimes it's a switch. Sometimes it's a leather belt. Sometimes it's just a couple times, and sometimes he takes me around in circles. Y'all understand what I'm saying? But listen, that just proves something, that you belong to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Back up that verse one time. Verse 5. Look what he says. My son, despise not. Don't despise it, that the chastening hand, the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. Why? Look at this. This is some good stuff right here. Verse number 6. For whom the Lord, what? He chased me. God don't ever chase me because he don't love you. Oh, God loves everybody. That's right. That's right. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. You tell me, preacher, that God don't love everybody? I'm telling you that God don't pay no attention to the lost crowd until they become one of his crowd. Y'all hear what I'm saying? You know what I mean? God takes care of them. He can't. His, his book will be a lie. What does God, this is, uh, this is all God does with lost people. Convict. Convict. He convicts them, and that conviction should draw them. As they're being drawn to what? To the saving knowledge of the Son. The law of the schoolmaster. Book of Galatians. Y'all know what I'm talking about. He, he, he convicts the lost man to dr bring him to his son. If the lost man don't want nothing to do with conviction and, 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 and salvation, God ain't got nothing else to do with him. Why? Because you're too important to him. So he's out here taking care of the sheep. Why? For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Look at verse 7. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with what? Now you can say what you want to say. You parents in here know what I'm talking about. You deal with your children different than what you deal with other children. Me, I can have patience with a three-year-old. I got patience with a two-year-old. I got patience with a seven, eight-week-old. Two of them grandkids. One of them is my daughter. But you, and you know, I, I tolerate a little bit more. Why? Because I can bust her butt. And I ain't scared to bust her butt. Why? I bust it now when she's three. I won't have to be worried about it when she's 23. Yeah. Why? The Bible tells us that. But put me in down there without a water crowd right now, I can't handle it. <laughs> I can't handle it. Don't put me around. I, I, I can't, I, 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 there's, a, there's a reason why I'm not in the nursery. There's a reason why I'm not in children's ministry. You know, I can deal with teens a little bit. You know, no, I can't jack them up, but I can put them in their place a little bit better. But if I go and I deal with a three-year-old, you know, down there like I deal with a teenager, you know, they're going to be crying. They ain't never coming back. We got lawsuits from everywhere. <laughs> the point I'm making is this. God deal with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? What good is a daddy don't bust his children's butt? What good is a daddy that don't correct his children and make them mine? We live in a deception of a mentality of thinking where children can run the roost. If, if Junior don't want to do it, we ain't going to do it. I, 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 bull heck. Ain't no three-year-old going to tell a 46-year-old what he going to do with his life. The 46-year-old is going to tell the three-year-old whether they like it, love it, or love it. They still going to do it. If they don't do it, guess what they do? They get carried out in church and get their butt whooped. Why? Because that's the way my father treats me. Y'all hear what I'm saying? For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? I'd be concerned if I never experienced the chastening hand of God. Look at verse 8. But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then ye, then are ye bastards? And not sons. That's not a cuss word. It's a Bible word. The definition of that is you're lost on your way to hell. You don't belong to God. In other words, like this right here, I'm preaching on deception. It's somebody who is void of chastisement 
in their life are deceived if they're not experiencing the chastening. In other words, it's impossible to be saved and not have chastisement. Why? Because you still live in a body of flesh. You still tangle. You still, uh, uh, you still have sin thrown at you. Y'all follow what I'm saying? And we yield to it. Say amen. And when we yield to it, do we not get chastised? Right? Well, if somebody don't experience, in other words, they can walk in on church on Sunday, shout glory, hallelujah, go around and sit at the bar on Monday, sip them a little toddy, nothing bothers them, and they can walk back in church on the next Sunday, and you know what, and say glory, hallelujah, walk back out of church, jump into bed unmarried, you know what I'm saying, and do all these things that the world is doing, and say, oh, everything's all right with me, me and God's got our own thing going on. I just gave you not Timmyology, I didn't give you greater lifeology, I didn't give you baptistology i just gave you bibleology the bible says if you ain't experienced the chastened hand of god ye are bastards and not sons look at verse nine i ain't gonna get through all this tonight furthermore we have had fathers of our what which corrupt corrected us i started to say corrupted corrected us and we gave them what reverence now, let me ask you, you older folk in here. I ain't going to ask the younger crowd, but you older folks in here. Did you not honor your father? Did you not honor your mother? Let me ask y'all. Y'all ever get y'all's rear ends tore up? Now, let, let's be honest for a minute. Let, let's be dead honest for a minute. They wore you out. And at the time, he made you upset. At the time, you didn't really understand it. But as the smoke settled, and you looked around, you knew your daddy loved you. And it made you reverence him. I have a problem with people who don't reverence God. I ain't chasing that rabbit tonight. Shall we not much, shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father? See that capital F? That first father was a lowercase, your earthly father. The next one is a capital, father of spirits and live. Shall we not much rather, go back, shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the father of spirits? Look at this, look at this. And what? Live. Which there ain't no living outside of subjection to the father. You hear what I'm saying? See how that Bible's breaking down, making a little bit more sense? Life, real living, is in subjection to the Father. Oh, I ain't going to subject to nobody. You know, I know there's authority problem in the world we're living in. But God ain't no tyrant. God's a gentleman. He asked you to walk with him. And I can go on and tell you, God has uh, your best interest at his heart. He only wants the best for you. He ain't going to ask you to do something that's uh, crazy, out of, that's going to bring harm to you. He's going to put you in positions to what? To make you a better child of God. Real living is in subjection to the Father of Spirits. Look at verse number 10. For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure. But he for our profit, that we might be partakers of what? His holiness. When we whipped our children, whenever I whipped Cambry Grace Sunday morning in that men's bathroom, I was trying to drive something out of her. Y'all understand what I'm saying? That she could be partaker of something. When God chastens you, He's trying to drive something out of you that you may experience and be partaker of his holiness. Why? Because nine times out of ten, that chastisement is brought on by rebellion. Amen. You ever heard this? I can't quote it exactly, but it's like, it's like this right here. God, I have no fellowship with sin. So God wants to have fellowship with you. 
So whenever we have that sin in our life, God says, you know what I got to do? I got to drive that out. So he brings out the old leather belt. You know, them things ain't, ain't, ain't around most households no more. He brings out the leather belt, and he wears your rear end out to drive that out of you. Why? Because he wants to be able to commune with you. He wants to be able to fellowship with you. Does that make sense? Listen, those who are void of chastisement are deceived. The blank of chastisement, look at verse number 5, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5. Go back to 5 for me. The God of chastisement, look at verse 5, I'm not going to read it all again. It said, I will read it. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children, my son, despise not thou the chastening of the who? The Lord. The Lord. The Lord. This thing of religion is not a dictatorship. It is a lordship. There's a difference between dictatorship and lordship. Man, I'm covering a lot of ground tonight. I didn't intend to cover. There's a difference between dictatorship and lordship. A lot of people behind pulpits, they're not wanting you to have lordship. They're wanting to give dictatorship. They want you to live, act, and operate the way they want you to live and act and operate. They want to build their little kingdom. They want to make sure you're living and doing this according to what their taste is. But that ain't what lordship is. That's dictatorship. Lordship is when God Almighty himself, Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords, is the Lord of your life, which means everything you say or do, where you go, what you eat, how you smell, what you listen to, what you're what everything is under the leadership of God. The God of chastisement. He says right there, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord. If I'm the only one that makes you feel guilty when I preach, you've got a problem. You've been deceived. If preaching of the Bible does not bother you, you have a problem. Some people say, oh, your preaching don't bother me. Well, you got a major problem if it's Bible preaching. Y'all hear what I'm saying? A lot of people, they, 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 they're, they're far left and far right. Some people won't do nothing but what the preacher says. And if the preacher don't say it, they ain't going to do it. And if they're living what the preacher says, listen, I'm serious. If they're living what the preacher says, then in their mind, they're right with the Lord. You hear what I'm saying? No, they're being deceived. you got to live according to the Bible. And if your preacher, your pastor, the one you're listening to, whether it's online or wherever, at, whoever you're listening to, if he's lining up with the Bible and you're lining up with the Bible and you're trying your best to live for the Lord, y'all going to jive together. Y'all understand what I'm saying? Everybody may not be walking the same stroke. Everybody may not be crossing the T with the same color of V. But you know what you're going to do? You're going to cross your T. You understand what I'm saying? You're going to dot your I. Everybody's going to come up short. Why? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But if the ambition and the goal is to go with God, we're going to be walking in the same direction. Listen, this chastisement is by God. A lot of teenagers, they'll live for God, they'll do this, they'll do that, and mom and daddy, the preacher or the pastor, you know, puts on and make them feel guilty. This is how I can always tell if something's of God when somebody jumps up to do it. As soon as the smoke begins to, uh, to settle and the excitement is gone, is it still there? You hear what I'm saying? But listen, look at this. I, I know I'm chasing a lot of rabbits, but it's good rabbits. <clears throat> People void of chastisement or deceived. Look at the God of chastisement. Number two, look at the good of chastisement. I think I already covered this. Six through eight. Go ahead, the six there for me, Nate. For whom the Lord loveth. That's good. Don't you think so? And scourges every son whom he re receiveth. That's a good word right there. I don't know about you, but it's good to know that God receives you. Because you don't every, everybody can't walk up into the throne room of God. Only the blood-bought children of God got that right in there. And the accuser of the brethren goes, now I don't know, now I, I, I ain't got no Bible on this, and maybe we can sit down sometime and find out. I don't know if the devil walks into the throne room and accuses. I don't know. He may have to stand back outside somewhere and be hollering at him. I don't know if he was at the feet of God in Job chapter number 1. He could have been standing outside the gate of heaven saying, hey, I got one down here. You let me have him, I'll destroy him. Y'all understand what I'm saying? I ain't got no Bible to say where it goes, but I do know this. He's accuser of the brethren. But there's good 
with chastisement because of the God of chastisement. Six through eight. Number three, the goal of chastisement. What's the purpose of it? Verses 9 and 10. Jump up to 9 for me. They corrected us. They gave them reverence. How much shall not much rather be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? You see the good that comes out of chastisement? Let me ask you parents something. When your kids do something just crazy and you chastise it and you correct it and they receive it and they correct it in their life, don't it make for a better living? Don't it make for a better night? I mean, you leave in the morning, you know, and, and, and you say, hey, Junior, get in there, do the dishes, ch- clean your room, yada, yada, yada. You come in, they ain't done nothing. They've been sitting there on PlayStation all day long and ain't done none of it. You know, you blow your top, kick over a couple things, get your belts out, beat the devil out of them, and tell them they better get in there and do it after you done jerk the TV out, the PlayStation out, throw it out the back door, say you ain't never getting it again, you know. And, and you know, you go and take your shower, you come back, and the room's clean. How's that make you feel? Makes for better living, don't it? Let me ask you this. You ever had a rebellious teenager? No matter what you tell them, they ain't going to listen. How was the tension in the house? How was the strife in the house? Now, I'm using these physical aspects to show you the spiritual aspect. Could it be the reason there's so much stress, tension in your life? Because we ain't in subjection. It's good. You see, in the world we live in, you don't bow down to nobody. Ain't it funny how all these idiots out here is demanding that people bow down to them? There ain't but one you bow down to. And that's God. That's where you find life at. Listen, those who are void of chastisement are deceived. You got the God of chastisement, you got the good of chastisement, and you got the goal of chastisement. Let's try to cover this next one. Number two. Those who are void of change, C-H-A-N-G-E, change, are deceived. Notice the maniac of Gadara. We're going to go to Mark chapter number 5. We're going to do Mark chapter 5, verse 15. Everything's in one verse. Bring up Mark 5, 15. Change. People void of change are deceived. What do you mean? People that profess salvation, but nothing changes in their life. Listen to me. Everybody don't grow on the same plateau. But the Bible says, the Bible says, it made me go to 2 Corinthians 5, 17. That was my first one, my fault, bud. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away, which means change. Behold, all things are become new. Now listen, something old, Can't be something new. And something new can't be something old. Means there's a change. Two things different are not the same. So in other words, somebody who is void of change in their life are deceived. Now we'll go to Mark 5, verse 15. Look at the maniac of Gadara. You know the story in Mark chapter number 5. This guy's demon-possessed. This man is leaving in the tombs. Man, he's naked in the tombs. He's beating himself up in the tombs. He's cutting himself rocks with, uh, with rocks in the tombs out there. He, uh, uh, cheddar, uh, fetters and chains can't bind him. No man can help him. He's out there to his own. He's lost his family. He's lost his friends. It's just him and another guy because one of the gods tells there's two of them out there, but whenever Jesus stepped on shore one of them splits but the maniac of Gadara stayed there and something happened look at number one look at his new position look at his new position mark 5 15 a and they came to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion sitting notice his change of position his position he has a new position he once was running to and fro, cutting himself, uh, everything up. But now he's sitting, sitting. Somebody who gets saved and born again or a Christian who has nothing new in their life, there's nothing new developing in their life. That's what growth is about. Growth is about change. If you've been saved for 40 years and you're still stuck where you was at 40 years ago, you better check up. Why? Because there ain't, when you get saved, you're on the milk. 
40 years later, you ought to be on the meat. And we all know milk and meat make a big difference in your world. Y'all hear what I'm saying? Look at his position, a new position. Number two, his new purity, purity. He's clothed. See that? He's clothed. He was naked in the tomb, but now he's clothed. Now, we can make all kinds of spiritual applications, but for the sake of time, his purity, Kimbot to his purity. Y'all hear what I'm saying? Somebody, now listen, ain't none of us perfect. Let me say that again. Ain't none of us perfect. And I know there's an inward man down there on the inside who is pure, cannot sin, will not sin, never will commit sin. But the problem is this man on the outside. And we mess up. We've already discovered that. We already talked about it. If you don't have some type of purity in your life, let me explain to you like this. What music you desire? I ain't preaching on your music. I just ask you what music you desire. Purity. What's your eyes drawn to? By way of internet, by way of cell phone, uh, what, what's it drawn to? How'd you, how'd you dress? I ought to have the teenage girls up here. How'd you dress? What do you dress for, is what I should say. What do you dress for? If you dress for the eyes of somebody else, where's purity in that? Y'all hear, y'all hear what I'm saying? Now, I didn't say you was perfect. But what I'm saying is, is it's very, very important that there's change in your life. I don't know about you. I don't know it all. But I sure am glad I still ain't where I was back in 1995. You hear what I'm saying? His new position, his new purity. Number three, look at his new peace. The Bible says right there, and in his right mind and they were afraid you know what blows this world's mind what makes them afraid of us you want to know why the world's afraid of christians because we have a new position we have a new purity what was that learning? we got a new peace we got a right mind i don't think the way i used to think now, it don't take much to make the old man come back up. You know, I love that song. They sing the old man's dead. I can out to it, too, clap to it, too, and, uh, you know, and, and it sounds real good. But truth of the matter is, Nathan Timothy Blue is still well, alive, and living right now. If you don't believe that, push my buttons at the church. And y'all can all act holy all you want to, but somebody push your button. It don't take much. Just push the button. And you know what? It ain't no Jesus. It, you ain't worried about chastisement. You ain't worried about nothing. You worried about, I'm going to give them a piece of my mind right there. Amen. Amen. Sit at that red light here in a few minutes when the thing turns green and keep looking at your cell phone. See how much preacher Tim had loved Jesus. But people with no change, with no change are deceived. Number three, we can finish it tonight. Number three. People who are void of conflict are deceived. Look at Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 through 17. People void of conflict. Oh, we supposed to, we ain't supposed to have conflict. Well, we're going to find out. This I say then, walk in the what? And ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Look at verse 17. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit that's why i say the things that i do you can act the holy you want to you live in the body of flesh your flesh is against god your flesh don't love god your flesh don't care about the things of god your flesh don't want holiness your flesh don't want peace your flesh don't want purity your flesh don't want the position your flesh wants to go out here live like hell act like hell be a part of hell your flesh wants the things of this world oh no preacher i don't want to. you can tell by all your what your flesh wants about what the bible says for the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh there is a conflict there if there's no conflict, you are being deceived. 
Listen, I still struggle with things, wanting things of that world out there. There's a conflict. Oh, Christians can't have no good time. Oh, I can have a good time if I subject myself to God and live. But there's a conflict there. But people void of conflict, people void of conflict, hey, they're being deceived. And the Bible tells you right there, for these are contrary, the one to the other. They don't get along. They don't get along. They have split personalities. You ever been accused of having different personalities? I have. I got them. You ever been accused of hearing voices? Yeah, me too. I hear them. There's always a war going on. There's a conflict that I once did not know about. Before I was saved, there was no war. Before I was saved, I act like I wanted to act, did what I wanted to do, drank what I wanted to drink, ate what I wanted to eat, went where I wanted to go. There was no conflict. I was pleasing to him. But after I got saved and born again, became a new man in Christ, got my new position, got clothed in the righteousness of God, got my peace. Y'all understand what that? A conflict came on board. It would have been a whole lot easier if he would have saved the spirit on the inside, the soul, and the flesh. But he didn't do it that way. So that ye cannot do the things that ye would. Number one under number three. The blank of the conflict. Look at the wind of the conflict. The wind of the conflict. Exodus chapter 17 verse 8. Pull that up. Then came, look at that. Then came Amalek. And fought with Israel and whatever that word is right there. If y'all can pronounce it, God bless you. Tim, don't read that good. But the point of it is, then came Amalek. There's a then in everybody's life. There's an Amalek in everybody's life. The problem is we don't get rid of the Malachites. I need to preach that message again. I can still hear all the Malachites behind you. That's the problem in a lot of people's lives, the Amalekites. But look at the when. When he came. When you got saved, that conflict should have began. And if you do not struggle with the things of God, now listen, now listen, now listen. There's a fine line there. There's a fine line there between the conflict and the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Some people will take their struggle with their flesh and the things that God is asking them to do, you know, just things that a Christian ought to do that they're not doing out of pure rebellion and the chasing hand of God. And they'll say, well, there's my conflict. That's not what I'm talking about. I ain't talking about you willfully sinning and having sin in your life. That's not the conflict I'm talking about. I'm talking about the conflict of you striving to serve God, love God, doing your best to get rid of the sin. You're doing your best every day to put the left foot in front of the right foot and to have your day pleasing unto the Lord. But at the same time, you still got this battle going on the inside and the Amalekites show up in your life. Look at the wind of the conflict. Look at number two. The why of the conflict. Why of the conflict. Romans chapter number 6, verse 16. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey. Whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. Why the conflict? Because who we yield to. Do you want to make the conflict kind of settle subject to God but the reason a lot of folks don't subject is because they're being deceived they have no chastisement they have no change they have no conflict you see the why of it look at the Bible says know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey his servants ye are to whom ye obey in other words whoever you feeding is going to be the strongest in your life whether it's the flesh or the spiritual man Number three, number three, you're 730 now. The blank of the conflict, the winning of the conflict, the winning. 1 Corinthians 9, 27. But I keep under my body and bring it unto what? Subjection. Lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Look at that. When I put my body under subjection, there is a winning in this thing. You can 
say what you wanted to, but I want a conflict early. What was that conflict? I was tired. I was wore out. The flesh wanted to stay at the house. But you know what the flesh did? The flesh got up, got ready, came to the house of God. I'm feeling pretty good right now. Say amen right there, even if you don't agree with it. And you know what? I won the conflict over there a few hours ago. Y'all understand what I'm saying? But if there ain't a conflict in your life, if there ain't no change in your life, if there ain't no chastisement in your life, it's a pretty good chance that the greatest tool of the devil, which is uh, deception, is very active in your life. Listen, don't be deceived. God is not mocked. Be all you can be for the glory of God. Take these outlines I give you. Go home, take those scriptures, search them out, continue to look at them. And don't be deceived. The biggest, one of the biggest deceptions we'll find in the Bible, we could teach and preach on that too, is feelings. Feelings. Who is it? Hey, was it Jacob? Was it Jacob? Who was it? His boys come in there. And you know, one on one, the birthright. And, and you know, they put the. Who? Esau and Jacob. What um put the put the hair on and come in there and deceived his daddy. You know what why he deceived him? Because he was about half dead and blind. He reached up and felt him. And what it felt like, oh, that must be him. Guess what? It wasn't him. That's why it ain't wise to make major decisions based on how you're feeling. I hope tonight you got something out of it. I'm going to pray, be dismissed. Don't forget, Sunday morning, 10 o'clock Sunday school, 11 o'clock service. Sunday night, 5 o'clock, we'll begin to study the book of Revelation, and then we'll see what goes from there. Father, we love you. God, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be in the house of God tonight, the study of God's Word. I pray, Lord, tonight as we expose a few things, we examine our hearts, make sure we're not under the, uh, the deception of the devil, that we'll live our life pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, I